Okay. So yes, as Pedro rightly said, I'm Onel Lopez. I was a PhD student in the group of Hirley at the beginning of IIT, and and then I started working on the the topics related to radio frequency wireless power transfer and how to provide sustainable way for supporting the life of these IoT devices, which is one of the directions that then the IoT projects, the EIoT project took. So basically, I'm now going to be talking about um, how to massively and safely support the wireless power transfer of IoT devices in the, in the coming years. So as you know, the, the rise of wireless communications and technologies and servicing is, is, is practically leading to an increasing, increasingly digitalized and data-driven society. Uh, here we see the, the forecast, for example, from Ericsson, and observe that the number of IoT devices, uh, either of wide area or short range technologies, will significantly increase in the, ne in the next few years. And such devices include, for instance, wearables, sensors, and others. And how their number increases affect, will affect the various industry verticals differently. However, uh, what it is common to all is that existing solutions that rely on wired sensing and charging are cost prohibited to deploy at all the locations. Uh, the same is true also for battery power solutions especially considering the, the, the short battery lifetimes. And one thing is true, and it is that it's difficult to support these growth predictions, and especially others that are more optimistic if all the devices uh, had to run on batteries. So here we have the battery replacement problem, which comes together with the scheduled maintenance and battery replacement tasks, and especially the e-waste problem. On the other hand, uh, the increase in the number of mobile phones, PCs, uh, and tablets is not significant, and it will not be significant in the coming years. However, uh, although they can work on, on wire charging and batteries without causing extra penalties with respect to the, the current landscape, people uh, nowadays and more than ever are seeking for an uninterrupted and flexible online connection. I mean, they, they want to, to keep it online. So with a wireless charger, you cannot freely move. And even with wireless power transfer solutions that are available today, you cannot also freely move while you are charging the device. So this is an important constraint that we try to, to, to solve in the coming years. And the two main questions here for these two different scenarios are, for the first one is how to realize a scalable low power wireless charging. So to face the, the increasingly massive number of devices, low power devices. And for the second group is how to realize safe, high power wireless charging. So here we have uh, the main wireless power transfer technologies that are available today and have been developing in the last few years. Uh, we have inductive coupling, and we have as an example the QI wireless mobile device charging standard, which is available in many mobile handsets nowadays. It's also used in, the, in an electric tooth, uh, toothbrush, especially in the internal mechanisms to avoid uh, electroshocks when you are brushing your, your mouth. And it's also present in some wireless power medical implants. We have also the, the magnetic resonant coupling with the Qualcomm e -Zone, which allows powering several uh, mobile phones and other wearables simultaneously. And this is really interesting, the Qualcomm Halo electric vehicle, which is promising for wireless charging the, your cars, electric cars, and also the, this higher wireless power HDTV. And in the other group, we have electromagnetic field radiation based wireless power transfer which is based on radio frequency signals like these two examples here from PowerCast and this one from Intel. And the, here we have this drone, which is powered from the ground, but using laser. So the main thing to notice here is that inductive and magnetic friction and coupling are the wireless power transfer solutions that are more available in the market. 
They, they are designed for short range charging and have limited multi-user support. And the most important thing is that they still confine the maneuverability and mobility of the devices being charged. So this limits considerably their scalability and their ability to support the, the, the massive IoT growth trends. On the other side, electromagnetic field radiation based uh, wireless power transfer exploiting radio frequency signals uh, can natively support multi-user uh, charging since the same RF signals can be harvested simultaneously by several devices and allows also greater charging radii. However, however, there are several challenges in this technology and art, which is the focus of our talk today frequency for wireless power transfer. And the first one is that the low end-to-end -end power transfer efficiency. Because charging based on radio frequency is nowadays slower and less efficient than traditional wire and near field wireless charging technologies as uh, inductive coupling and magnetic resonance coupling. As you can see, the, this inductive and magnetic coupling achieve very high efficiency, but at very short distances while the efficiency decay, decays more slowly with the distance if you use radio frequency signals. This is one key limitation and challenge how to overcome this issue. Also very important is the fear of wireless because people's concerns over exposure to radio wave are rising uh, with the advent of the fifth generation and future generation of wireless systems. And with the exploitation of the higher frequency bands. Uh, however, this fear, although irrational because uh, the, the transmission in this band is non-ionizing, so they are unable to change the, the structure of atoms and, and molecules, which would lead, for instance, to carcinomic, carcinogenic effects. But there is still there. So how to provide people with instruments, how to, uh, so they can measure the, the level of exposure they have to these signals. Uh, even some agency, international agencies have set, I mean, there, there are, they have set limits for the electromagnetic field exposure, but these are to avoid biological effects like increasing the uh, one degree temperature, for instance, of the tissues, human tissues. Although they won't affect the, the health, it would affect somewhat the the human system. So it is important to create metrics and transparency compliance with these uh, electromagnetic field radiation constraints imposed by regulatory bodies. And finally, the, the lack of technologic standardization. This is important also because standardization is required to guarantee technology interoperability so that the, the end users do not even know which wireless technology while the charging technology they are using. So they, it's possible to open the market. And nowadays the, the, the standardization in this regard is very incipient. So there are just few attempts. Uh, but we believe that solving the first two challenges would definitely promote more standardization attempts and also will address this, this last challenge. So at the end of the main goal, or of our research here is how to design a high end to end efficient architecture and radio frequency sharing protocols transparently complying with electromagnetic field exposure regulations. And that's being our focus in the last months and in a near future. Here, we, I will divide the talk in two parts into the scalable low power radio frequency wireless power transfer and the, into the safe high power radio frequency wireless power transfer. In the first part, we are talking about massive IoT networks. So how to provide wireless charging to these massive, uh, massive scenarios and how to, to make the, the, the solution scalable. And of course, we can have many, many use cases in, in IoT or internet of everything, wire sensor networks, smart grids, uh, industrial IoT, because the number of sensors can be massive. There is no other way to say this. So, and um, for that, we have developed a, a term which is referred as massive wireless energy transfer and referred specifically to this on how to support massive wireless power transfer to low power devices. 
There are some representative players, industrial players here, basically for low power charging, and these are mainly transfer fee, transfer fee and power cost. Maybe the second one is more is more known. And one interesting figure I would like I I bring I brought here is this one to the right here. So this figure illustrates how the radio frequency wire power technology can be more sustainable than the, the traditional wire charging and battery power alternative. <clears throat> the figure shows uh, the costs in terms of CAPEX plus OPEX for an industrial IoT used by a company to acquire, upgrade, or maintain physical assets, uh, like uh, plants, building, like the technology, or any equipment. Um, these, of course, are costs that are important for companies to maintain existing property and equipment, and invest as well in future, in new technology and other assets for growth. And OPEX is opera operational expenditure, and is an ongoing cost for running a product or, or, or the business in general. So if you sum these two costs, is like the, the main cost incurred by a system. Uh, this figure shows how these costs increase over the years for the, for the given product or ecosystem. And in case of radio frequency wise port transfer solution, which is a solution of transfer, transfer fee, which is the, the green line, you can see that it's more sustainable over time than using wire charging or, or just batteries. So obviously there is much more to do here. So this is not the final solution, but the gains are there. So why not invest in this kind of technologies? Regarding our research, so basically, our contribution on scalable low power high right, frequency wireless port transfer lies on proposing transmit CSI free or limited solutions. So uh, why why do we need CSIT free limited solutions? CSIT refers to transmit channel state information. So why do we need CSIT free limited solutions? Well, it is basically because CSI training trains energy resources from the IoT devices and may become unaffordable for them, especially when the, this number of devices is massive. And we have several words related to this, which are at, at the bottom of the slides, uh, proposing strategies regarding this. And mainly, the main advantage of using uh, CSI free or limited solutions lies basically on this. So basically, if one exploits the statistic structure or just the line of sight component of the channel, we have four advantages. First of all, the statistical CSIT remains accurate over a larger time scale in a static and quasi static setup. So you can use the same recorder uh, without changing for a considerably large period of time. Also, this statistical or structure of the time can be predicted based on machine learning or other statistical methods. The line of sight geometric channels are predominant in many radio frequency wireless sport transfer use cases because the distances are short. So line of sight tends to be the most uh, predominant in, that, in those scenarios. Also, instantaneous CSIT acquisition procedures can be run when system constraints are favorable. And you, we can just rely then on the statistical or or a structure of the channels when such constraints become stricter and then the, the CSIT auxiliary procedures cannot be supported. Now I'm going to discuss some briefly, some key results we've been having in the last few uh, months. Specifically, we've been addressing the multi-power beacon deployment problem. So the idea here is how to optimize the, the placement of these energy transmitters named power beacons to homogenize the energy provided to a given circular area. So the idea is to optimize the energy delivery in this, this area here. 
and the power vehicles are assumed to have a CSI free multi antenna beam forming strategy. <clears throat> and here at the right, we can see what is the optimal deployment for a different number of uh, power vehicles. As you can see, there is a certain symmetry in the deployment optimization, uh, which is indeed interesting. But at the end, it, it proved to be very difficult to decode in close form, decode this symmetry in close form for a general number of power vehicles. But of course, you can check more details in our publication below. Some results, for instance, we have here the, the minimum number of power vehicles that are required uh, as a function of the target charging area radius for different energy outage requirements of the devices. I have observed that a uh, such number increases almost linearly with the radius of the area. And obviously the most stringent uh, the requirements are I mean, when we move from this to this, because you have a smaller uh, energy outage requirement here, the more power beacons be you need to power the area. But the most interesting is that the increase is linear with the radius of the area. Uh, here in the figure to the, the right, we have the energy outage probability as a function of the number of antennas per, per power beacon. We have four, four scenarios with a single power beacon, two power beacons, three power beacons, and four power beacons. And the, the red line denotes uh, an arbitrary energy outage probability. Observe, for instance, that in case of scenarios with four PVs, four power beacons here, we need five antennas per power beacon. So for a total of five multiplied by four, 20 antennas in the system to support this energy constraint, energy outage constraint. In case of three power beacons, we need in total 70, uh, 27 antennas. In the case of two power beacons, we need 30 antennas in total. So yes, basically this means that for a limited number of total antennas in the system, having more power beacons with less antennas per power beacon is at the end more beneficial. So the number of power beacons play a more crucial role than the number of antennas. But at the end, we need to see how much uh, cost effective is one solution with respect to the others, because the number of power beacons influence differently than the number of antennas per power beacon when we want to evaluate the cost, the deployment cost, for instance. But I'm not going to talk about that here. We have this, in this other paper here below, we have an extension of this scenario when we consider the certain feedback from the devices. So we know more or less the, the position of the devices and the energy they, <clears throat> they are required. But I will not talk about this now. And here we have some CSID freeze uh, multi antenna solutions. Uh, I mean, beam forming strategy without uh, CSI information, which is one of the key contributions in the, in the regard of massive wireless power transfer. For instance, to the, to the left, we have switching antenna strategies where we transmit with one antenna at the time only, and also, uh, antennas transmitted with the independent signals, AAIS. And these two provide the omnidirectional radiation pattern when we have a ULA a, a antenna at the center, ULA PV at the center. The interesting thing is that using these strategies, we provide full diversity in non-correlated channels, but there is no, no average harvesting gains. While these other two strategies to the right, which are based on transmitting the same signal over all the antennas, provide some directivity. So we can exploit this directivity to power more efficiently the devices that are uh, in the direction of these beams. However, this same directivity is not beneficial for those devices that are not in the beam direction of, uh, in the direction of the beams that are generated. So that's a key problem. Observe that this first beam pattern here is generated without any phase shift into the, in the antennas, while this to the sec to the right is generated by just alternating zeros and pi's in consecutive antennas. 
still one point radius in consecutive antennas. So the problem, as I told before, is the directivity itself, because you can provide gains to the device that are in the, in the direction of the beams, but not to those that are that lie in these blind spots, for instance, here, here. So for that, we have developed this rotary antenna beam forming graph, where we physically rotate the, the beam, the, the antenna ray. So as shown in this, I hope you can see the animation, probably you, you can. In this case, we have eight antennas and we are employing this, this radiation here. You can see this is broader here because it's generated with four antennas, but here we have eight antennas and are rotating. And with that, and averaging over time, we can create this quasi omnidirectional beam pattern over time. And the interesting thing is that this omnidirectional uh, beam pattern is, has a gain both in average and in diversity, and it's related to, and this gain is, is pretty approximated to 0 0.85 square root of M. M is the number of uh, uh, transmit antennas. One other additional advantage of this is that uh, we have, a <clears throat> in case of the devices are obstructive for several articles, there are more chances to reach those devices by changing the, the orientation of the power vehicle, by rotating the power vehicle, because we can explore uh, reflections and other scattering phenomena and reach these devices more efficiently. So that's uh, an inherent, inherent advantage of this study as well. <clears throat> Here, let's discuss a bit about safety issues. So as I was commenting earlier, wild forward and persistence must, must be subject to strict regulations on the electromagnetic field radiation levels that users may be exposed to. Uh, for instance, in terms of maximum permissible exposure, MPE, and a specific absorption rate, SAR. These regulations minimize the, the potential biological effects like tissue heating, uh, which may be caused by, caused by uh, radio frequency radiation. Specifically, the MPA <clears throat> is specified in watts per, meter, per square meter, and SAR measures the absorbed power in a unit of human tissue by using units of uh, watts per kilogram. In this case, we are only focusing on the SAR, which is more important for short distances in the, in the order of centimeters and few meters, uh, because this is more relevant when the, the transmitter is close to the, to the to human tissue or uh, bio, bio tissue. For instance, Mobile terminals are, so, are subject to SAR constraints, to, to name an example. <clears throat> in case of a, for the case of our rotary antenna beam forming, one may need to apply SAR constraints to certain rotary angles. For instance, if we have a human hand close to the device, uh, we need to constrain the power of those beams that are close to the, that are in the direction of, of the of the human tissues. So the SAR constraints are usually given in the form of a complex emission matrix as this one, which at the end traduces to power constraints per beam. And we, we limit the, the, the power of these beams that are in the direction of the human tissue, as I showed there. So in the paper below, we show how to do this in the efficient way, because although you need to reduce the power of this beam, then you increase the power of the others that are not constrained. <clears throat> and here I have some, some few examples of the performance that can be attained with this, with this scheme. But then the figure to the left, we show the, the average worst case radio frequency energy availability in a given target area as the number of energy harvesting devices uh, that are distributed randomly increases. And the main thing to observe is that our proposed RAP uh, scheme can attain the best performance and even better than CSI, full CSI beam forming with fixed antennas. I mean, this CSI, this full CSI is implemented in a, 
in a fixed uh, stationary antenna array. And the gains over that increases as the number of devices increases. And to the right, we can observe the, the constraining effect of the SAR. So as the SAR constraint relaxes, which is as we move toward the, the right of the x-axis, the beamforming designs are more freely optimized and thus uh, we can achieve better performance. I mean, the performance increases and tends to be that one of the unconstrained SAR system. And again, in the case of RAP, this performance can be significantly superior to that of the, of the full CSI recorder, which is operating with a non rotary antenna array. So the next steps in these directions are mainly, or we hope to follow this, these directions in the, in the near future is investigate the, the performance of CSI free schemes on the other antenna topologies, because right now we have just analyzed and characterized the performance when using linear arrays. So what would be the performance of circular, rectangular, et cetera? And what is the optimal antenna array? We will also investigate the optimum orientation of the antennas in a multiple orbital scenario. And also for the scenario with multiple power beacons, which are equipped with rotary antennas, what gains can be achieved with, with the coordinate antenna rotation? So if we coordinate properly the, the rotation of these antennas up each power beacon, how to make this system to be harmonized and, and what gains can be attained in, that, in those cases. In the other case, we have in the other scenarios, we have how to provide safe high power radio frequency wireless power transfer. And the main scenarios are illustrated here. Uh, recently, we are aiming to support more energy demanding devices, such as wearables in a room or robots in a factory scenario. And the key question here is how to make the, the charging system sustainable over time and competitive also. Uh, with respect to the state of the art charging solutions that are short range. And uh, here, a special attention should be put also to the safety component, since in this case, the, the radio frequency wise power transfer should be stronger. I mean, you need more power. So, how to make the, the system safe in terms of complying with electromagnetic field radiation exposures? So, this is the question how to realize safe high power wireless charging? And these are the main, the main players. These three first uh, industrial player energies, OSEA and Guru, have already several commercial products. They are mostly operating, they, they products are mostly available in US because they have kind of less constraint. Uh, the the electromagnetic field related constraints are less tight than here in Europe. So but still they, they have to comply with the regulations there. Um, although they don't show exactly how they do this, this is supposed to be patented, but it's not completely clear. And, and there is a lack of understanding in how they are measuring, how they are, uh, how they claim that these are safe products in the, I mean, how they comply with these regulations. Also, Xiaomi, uh, at the beginning of this year, is presenting a demo, uh, a functional product with, which is composed, the, the power beacon in this case is composed of five built-in phase interference antennas to detect receiver's locations, and a, five, a 145, 44 millimeter wave antenna array for energy beam forming. Uh, and they are showing that they can serve several meters with five watt charges, but they are not saying how they are ensuring the safety measures. I was going to present a video, but I think I'm constrained on time, so I'll better skip it. But I will share it afterwards if you want in the chat on how Xiaomi is presenting a solution for radio frequency wireless power transfer. <clears throat> So this is a recent scenario we've been addressing lately. And the first publication was back in October. This is a paper in transaction-wise communication has been on their major revision. 
And here we have uh, the system model where we can observe, uh, we are proposing establishing the radio sticks at the ceiling level where we have a millimeter wave uh, antennas placement with a massive number of antennas to cover uh, wearables in a room or other high power devices. And um, this picture to the right, we can see how many power beacons can be equipped in the radio strips as one increases the operation frequency. Obviously, as you increase the operation frequency, the separation of the devices must be, uh, can be smaller and then you can equip with, with more power beacons. And in this case. <clears throat> Now, uh, remember that there were mainly two metrics for assessing the electromagnetic radiation exposure, and those were the MPE and the SAR. In this case, the radio strips are at the ceiling level, so humans are unlikely to be in this region R0 here. So we are constraining the humans uh, to be up in this part of the room, which is denoted as R1. Um, so the MPE in this case is a more suitable metric because it's designed for high frequency. It's more useful for high frequency and in the, the, in the far field, in this case at several, at in the order of two meters away from the transmitter. So we are considering only the MPE in this case. And we are considering two, two main metrics to evaluate the MPE. First, in the proximity of the UEs, so in this sphere, around the UE at a certain distance, RK, and also randomly in the, in the room. Any random point in the room must comply with this, with a certain MPE constraint. And here we have some results. <clears throat> some results, for instance, in this case, we have the, the fuel to left illustrate the average radio frequency power density in the proximity of the U at the distance RK here. And as observed, uh, the average RA power density increases quickly as one moves away from the, from the UE. Observe that this is a, a log scale, so the decrease is, is quick. Meanwhile, in the figure to the right, displays the cumulative distribution function CDF of the radio frequency power exposure in the room as a whole. And here we can observe that the changes, the chances of high, of high radio frequency power exposure in the order of one watt at a certain special point in, in the, the region, R1, are significantly small. So we are, we are with the chances of operating with zero watts. So it's very, very small. That chance. And this is for a single UE, but when the, there are multiple UEs, then this is not so smooth because we need to power several points in space and the, the, this creates some non-linearities in space that make difficult to constrain this, uh, constrain to obey the electromagnetic field related issues. But the main thing from these figures is that the system becomes more electromagnetic friendly as the operation frequency increases. And this is mainly because of the, uh, of the better spatial resolution, I mean the, the smaller wavelength of the transmit signal. So it's easier to obey the, the, the electromagnetic frequency constraint as you increase the frequency. However, as you increase the frequency, you require higher power from the radio strip system because the, the frequency dependent losses increased, which are the, the, those losses that don't depend on distance, those losses increases. And also uh, our optimization framework is really difficult to implement in the, or to execute in the high, in the massive mammal regime where you have many, many antennas. So this is a challenge we need to solve how to optimize the system in the massive MIMO, MIMO region. For that, the results we mainly use in the, in the paper are for the four gigahertz frequency band, this region here. And for that, we see here in the figure to the right how the, the transmit power of the radio strip system increases as you increase the number of devices. 
increases even if we are constraining the total power the total power requirement of all the devices to be one watt. So we are not increasing the energy demands in total. So it's the same energy demand and still the power transfer of the, the required power of the system increases. So all these are basis in the song, and there are a few others also in the, the papers, which I invite you to, to go for more details. But the next steps are mainly these ones. So basically the deficiency of the concierge system is considerably low in the order of uh, 0 0.1 and 1%, which means that 99 to 99.9% .9 of the energy is wasted, mainly to distance frequency and hardware dependent losses. So to make the technology profitable and enable sustainability, such energy uh, waste must be reduced as much as possible. For instance, by increasing the number of transmit and, and receive antennas. For instance, we consider so far a single antenna UE, but for instance, say the hardware is constrained on the dimension of four by four centimeters. So operating at four gigahertz allows to operate with four antennas operating at at four receive antennas operated to 28 gigahertz, we can operate with 71 receive antennas, and at 100 gigahertz, we can operate with 765 receive antennas. However, also the optimization problem dimension will become significantly large, and there is an urgent need of affordable computing networks for this. Uh, moreover, there is also another next step to be to, to deal with this. There is an increased energy waste when serving multiple users simultaneously, especially because of the electromagnetic electric constraints become more difficult to fix. So intelligent scheduling mechanisms are worth investigating here. Also, since the consider system performs centralized optimization decisions, each power beacon needs to inform the estimated CSI to the central processing unit uh, over limited whole connections. So the performance losses due to quantified CSI and, and quantified energy from this information may be significant, significant and they are worth evaluating. <clears throat> to start concluding, this is the, the vision of our our vision on how a sustainable radio frequency wire for software can be composed of Especially the main components we foresee for this kind of systems are this one, these four here. The specially distributed power beacons, uh, reconfigurable meta surfaces, and multi antenna energy harvesting devices. This is because the attainable energy informing spatial gains scale with the number of uh, transmit and receive antennas. So we need to design a proper massive MIMO deployment to compensate the, the extremely large channel losses and support also ubiquitous energy access. Uh, also, obviously, using the configurable meta surfaces and also multiple antennas of the receivers will help also here. In the second place, we will need auxiliary nodes, such as sensors and cameras for assisting sensing and uh, ultra accurate position, not only of the target use energy investing devices, but also uh, living and non-living obstacles. And in fact, uh, the Xiaomi product is also exploiting a kind of uh, position assistant mechanism. Very important is also the wireless power transfer management system, which decides the charging and related strategies. The everything, all the processing out optimization can be run at the local scale or global scale, depending on how 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 demanding how demanding is the the, the, the margin in that case. And finally, there's the charging protocols, which include not only the wild quantum signal, but all the signaling that is carried out to, to optimize the system. And basically, this is it. A proper holistic design of these components is key to unleash the full potential of uh, five frequency wild quantum and are turn it into a sustainable version. This is our, our claim. Um, obviously, if we really, have this, then we can increasingly bring attention of companies, startups, and the global market in general, and also propitiate more standardization attempts and commercial programs. All, all to eventually put these remaining wilds in our society. 
so all to make this sustainable IoT ecosystems. And that's it, that's all from my side. I just want to finish to invite you to, to go for our book. As Hilde mentioned before, this is one of the key outputs of EIoT, and it's a book called Counter by Me and, and Hilde on these topics. It's still not available, but it will be soon in January. So thank you all very much. And if you have any questions, you can contact me here or later. I will be happy to, to help. Thanks, Anel. Very good and nice presentation, actually. So I think this is. Thank you very much, Pedro. It was, it, 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 it's very nice. And then I think, as Hurley said, this was not what like I, we fought in, in EOT, but it's clear that like uh, uh, you took some ideas on that and develop your own path to these super nice ideas. And uh, uh, and I, I make like a the, the like a like a YouTube video, right? It is going to be online later. So buy the book. Uh, <laughs> so you can you can make our our advertisement here. Yeah, and, uh, a bit of advertisement. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And I review one of the chapters, so I'm looking forward to see the full book. So that's yeah, that's yeah. very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations. So uh 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 I let's let's to not to go too much uh, off the schedule. So I think maybe we can have a, a small break now, and then you come back in, in, in five minutes, and then you can uh, start with the second presentation and the, the presenter Subhan or, or Pavel can already start in, uh, uh, making, the, like, uh, making the practical things. It's like uh, sharing the screen and so on. And then you return quite soon. So you can just go and grab some coffee, go to the toilet and and then you return. And of course, I think this presentation by Arnold was very nice. People has, I, I'm sure that a lot of people have a lot of good questions. And then you can either post here in the in the chat, then Arnold can can reply offline for you, like uh, doing the other presentation. Then just send an email. So I think this is how we go. And then I'm sure that Arnold will be very happy to receive emails and discuss and and maybe even building potential new collaboration. So that's that's it. So thank you very much, Anel. And then thank uh, you. Uh, 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 look forward to see. Maybe hopefully I can see you in person in 2022. So <laughs> hopefully, yeah. yes. Okay. So let's have this short break. We are going to be. We are going to restart at two twenty. So six minutes. So and and.